Would you stand with us? seated this morning. There's a couple things that we want to take care of this morning. Um, the pandemic has been somewhat of a challenge, but there's some important things that we don't want to forget or, let, or get by us. As you see these beautiful flowers here, uh, many of you know Miss Betty Quarles passed this past week. Um, they had, because of what's going on in the country, the quarantine and so on, they had a uh, small graveside. But the hope is soon to have a memorial service here that we can all honor 
her life and all the service that she gave here. Uh, she was a joy to pastor. If you want to know what you ought to be doing in a church, your pastor ought not have to lie when he says that, okay? She was a joy to pastor. She had an infectious smile. Um, she could be ornery in a fun way, in a very fun way, and she will be missed greatly. Uh, Don and Pam is here, and we want them to know that we're praying for them. Uh, so I'll let you know uh, what the future holds when we do that memorial service to honor her life and her many, many years of service, faithful service, here and beyond grace. This morning we want to recognize our graduates, those that have graduated. So I'm going to ask them, uh, as I call their name, if they will come forward. Um, Terry Joe, I saw you come in. There you are. Uh, is Emma here? Nope. Is Drake here? Well, get up here. <laughs> I want to say how proud I am of both of them. Um, Terry Joe, you're about to head into the Marines, aren't you? Paris Island. God bless you, and we appreciate your <laughs> signing up to service. So we'll be praying for you, brother. You'll be fine. You'll do fine down there. As a little token, I wanted to give you this. Uh, keep with you. Whatever you do, don't take your eyes off the Lord. Um, both of you need to realize you've come to a, an incredible milestone and there's going to be a lot more in front of you and the key to success is keeping your eyes on the Lord Drake well, we're just glad you made it <laughs> I'm, I'm just picking with Drake Drake has come over the house uh, and stayed many times through the years I probably won't do your kid like that just Drake uh, but we are proud of you and uh, you're going on to school yeah, playing, football. playing football going on to school to play football I thought you were we are proud of you too, brother. We want to continue our worship service this morning. Uh, if you would stand with me. We want to invite the presence of God here this morning. It's good to see more and more of you coming each Sunday. Uh, and we're glad that you're here. We want to give uh, our thanks by giving back to the Lord this morning. If you're a guest with us, Hope you'll take time uh, to let us know. You can go to our website at, at gracelovesoconey.com. You can get some information about the church. Give us some of your information. But if you would, let's pray this morning as we ask God's blessing upon this service and upon the offering as we give back out of gratitude for all His love and His mercy toward us. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We thank You and we praise You, Father, that God, no matter what the uh, storms are that rage, out around us God you you if we keep our eyes on you just like Peter should have if we'll keep our eyes on you in the midst of the storm you always bring calm Amen. I pray father as we give back God we do it out of gratitude realizing the sense of urgency that it, that time is drawing near of when you're gonna come back and God we want not just to be found faithful God when we when we stand before you in heaven we want a lot of friends and family to be behind us because we have, we have shared the good news of Christ with them. And so, Father, we give with that, with that passion. May your name be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> if you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, same old boys tell the same old lie. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, you're the pain taker. You feel lost.
Somebody testify You believe it You receive it You can feel it Somebody testify, testify we say hallelujah that means praise the lord Amen. is this not the perfect time to praise the lord Amen. the times that we're living in with everything going on yep. praise the lord in the presence of my enemies Amen. praise him before the unbelief mm. praise him in everything and that's the reason we're doing this next song it's brand new so y'all sing it with us whether you know it or not how about that <clears throat> Raise a hallelujah. Amen. Always. Not just in this building. We're the yeah, church. That's right. We yeah, go every, out there. Every moment of every day. You raise a hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Let's keep this praise going. We have a king in glory.
Father, what we must do is lean on you during these times. Just as Brother Sean said, these events that we're seeing just shows the depravity of mankind. It should wrench our heart with sadness that we see a world turned upside down. But Father, give us the strength and the courage to go out as warriors and to conquer this land in your name for your glory. So when we see the things that are happening, it's a call to arms, not guns, not knives or any other type of weapon, but the weapon of the Word of God. We need to be faithful to you and be that light and that salt that you called us to be. We're your ambassadors. So we need to be used to heal this land. So Father, help us to be much more than what we were before. Because this world needs you desperately. So Father, as we hear your word this morning, help it to spur us on, to motivate us, to compel us to do your work even more diligently and urgently as before. So Father, I thank you that the Holy Spirit helps us to convict us of what we need to do for you. So we thank you for that, that you won't let us rest until we do what we're called to do. Father, we love you and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And he is our hope. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Testing. There we are. So I've had people get agitated at my sermons. And the reason they get agitated at other churches and even at this one, it's because of your view of God. It's because you really don't know who God is. The God that you serve and the God that you've followed for years is not the God of the Bible. That is an incredibly important thing is to know the one true living God. You cannot dwell in his presence if you do not know him. And so what, this series is about knowing the one true God. So if you have your Bible, I want you to read with me Isaiah 43. We want to read the first 21 verses. They're very important. He says, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When, you want to underline the word when, not if, but when, 
When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When, not if, underline that, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seb Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes. May not underline that. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Those I am's are pretty significant, particularly in the Gospel of John. <coughs> I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together, all the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed. Nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord. I'll help you understand John there. And besides me, there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also henceforth I am He. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans in the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior, they lie down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. That's important. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, and do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. I want to ask you a question. If I were to pass out a sheet of paper this morning and ask you to give me two paragraphs and you define for me who you are. Tell me who you are. What would you write? Many of you would begin with your career path. A lot of you would tell me about your family. But those are descriptions they are not who you are, the sum total of who you are. See, we begin in, in that exercise, you would begin by the things that you value. Not necessarily what makes you valuable, but the things you value. Here's when the problem occurs. If you lose that job, or that career path goes away, who are you then? Let's say you have a child that goes astray. Who are you then? The reality is, our only true value should come from God. Why do we have thousands of abortions every year? You ever wondered about that? Why is racism rampant in the world today? Why is that? 
We've taken our value from society rather than God. That's why that is. It's the reason materialism is the number one leading and the most destructive sin in America. Materialism. We draw influence from our bank accounts, from our job titles, by all the stuff we have. None of these bring lasting satisfaction. None of them. They're kind of like a bad drink that leaves a bad aftertaste. What really matters, the only thing that will matter for eternity, is how God values us. That's all that will matter. What is God's heart toward us? Why is it so important what God thinks of us? Because when our job ceases, when trouble comes to our family, when the stuff rusts and the money takes flight, then you realize what really matters in life. The only thing that matters in life then is your relationship, your personal relationship with God. And here's why. Now this... This is what you, you need to understand this morning. You're going to miss everything. You were created for a purpose. Now you've heard that and you've heard that and you've heard that. I want to break that down for you because that's what Isaiah is saying. He's telling us how to find self-worth. And it's not mommy sitting on the cell phone telling you how great you are and you're the best and the coolest. It's not that you're the CEO of whatever industry or plant it's not that you were able to buy a new car this week even though you were not able to afford it the only thing that brings value to your life is that you find God's purpose in life and you fulfill his purpose in your life he has a purpose for every one of us the first thing that Isaiah tells us here is this. Our purpose is to know God. God's name here, L-O-R-D, Yahweh, it is his covenant name. It means he is a covenant keeper. It, it tells us that God spoke this world into existence from nothing. He took time, verse 1, listen, to personally form you and I. God took time to form you. That means no one is an accident. Doesn't matter what kind of sin you were conceived in, we're all conceived in sin. No one is an accident. Doesn't matter, there's no victim's circumstance. We were created by a design. Every one of us. God himself designed us. And then he formed you. You. He formed you. Verse 1 he says, what I want you to do there is I want you to replace Jacob and I want you to put your name in it. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, oh, in your name, he formed you. You know what's very important in verse 19? It says that God will do a new thing. See, first you need to understand that God formed you. Then it says, verse 19, he's going to do a new thing. And if we're going to experience it, we must believe in our lives that God has a specific purpose and plan for us, for each of us. And if you don't, life is just a series of extended tragedies. You know, I, people ask all the time, well, without God, how are people? It's a cliche, we Christian folks say. How are people making it without God? Are you not watching TV? They're not. They're not making it. Suicide rate has exploded. Why? Because we were locked in our homes. Our sense of worth, our jobs, our stuff is in jeopardy. We're not making it without God. 
All this other stuff is just something to, to stimulate us and, pa- and buy, bid our time. But without God, without a specific purpose and a plan, life is nothing more than a set of extended tragedies. That's all it is. If there is no God and there is no plan that he has for us. So how do you explain life without God? Psalms 139, 16 says, God has already recorded the days of our lives. That is, that he knows and wants us to know what our life is really about. Do you know what your life is really about? He's already recorded the days of our lives. That means he has a blueprint specific for you, Doug. Mike, he has a blueprint just for you. You know what cracks me up? It cracks me up that all the church, every t- all 20 years in ministry, they believe that about me or some missionary that comes from far away and talks up here. But none of you believe that about you. Why is your life different than mine? But because I'm supposed to be serving him all the time and you just get to check in on a Sunday and go whoop off as you please on a Monday to a Saturday, it don't work that way, folks. He has no more of a specific plan for my life and a call in my life than he does yours. And when you watch people wander around and their kids wander around aimlessly destroying their lives and substance abuse and different things and and marriages and all these things exploding, it's because you're not following His plan. You will not receive fulfillment any other place. But think about that. God formed you and then formed a plan for your life. So well, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to discover and fulfill his plan and then follow it. You ever wonder why there's so many people that have midlife crises? You, you ever wonder that? Why so much of uh, so many a large percentage of people die after retirement? You ever wondered why? Let me tell you why because they waste their life following their own plan. God just didn't give a plan for preachers and missionaries to serve and sacrifice for Him all their lives. You have the same, you have that plan too. If you're not careful, you'll look around in the middle of your life or after retirement And you will realize that all you ever served was that career, that status, that title, that power, or you chased after all that stuff you really couldn't afford anyway. And it will be meaningless. And you will realize you have wasted your life. So many waste their lives. So many. See, it's not up to us to figure out what our, what our, it's not up to us to come up with a plan, rather. It's up, up to us to figure out what God's plan is for us and then bow before Him and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. To do anything else, to do anything else is to refuse Him. See, God's desire Here's the key, is that we first know Him. There can be no real meaning in life until you personally know God. It says, verse 1, He redeemed you. Can I tell you what that means? I know exactly what it means. I studied Hebrew for years. Anybody else in here study Hebrew for years? See, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I don't want you to miss. There's an incredible point right there. The words in the Hebrew that Isaiah the prophet used when he used the word redeemed, it points to one thing that happened in his era. 
In his era, when you went to the town square, you would see slaves. And their slaves wasn't, wasn't dependent on the color of skin. Their slaves was dependent upon the debt and the trouble they got themselves into. And there would be slaves in the marketplace. And they had lost their freedom. And in the marketplace, they were auctioning off those slaves. And Isaiah says that you and I, we were slaves. Jesus came to the marketplace and paid a high price to redeem us. That's the word redeemed there that he's using. He says we were redeemed. See, that's where the value in life comes from. We were slaves for sale. And God paid a huge ransom for us. What does it mean to know God? Now, this is important. This is important. If you miss this, you'll miss everything. I want you to look up here and listen to me. Romans 1 tells us that no intelligent person can walk outside these doors, look at this creation, and deny that there is a God. You cannot be saved by that, though. Knowing about a God is not the same as knowing God personally. You want to write that down? You'll need that later. There'll be all kinds of people in hell that knew there was a God. Knowing about a God doesn't equate to knowing God personally. You know what that book's about? We're studying at home group. It's about all the lost people that call themselves Christians that fill churches on a Sunday that know about a God. Don't know Him personally. The revelation in creation just proves to us there is a God. It does not tell how to know Him personally. God designed us to do that. That's what we're here for. You see, there's a huge difference in knowing about Him and salvifically knowing Him. Knowing about Him is God consciousness. Vast majority of America is God conscious. That's what chapter 10 in that book is that we're studying. We think in America because we're Republicans, conservative, and we're against some things, and we're for some things, and we celebrate the 4th of July, and we're patriotic, and we believe in God that we know Him. And Wrong answer. You can live in India and walk outside and see the same display of God's greatness and know that there is a God. That does not mean you know Him personally. Does not mean you know Him personally. There's a difference. You see, many churches, even this one here, there's a lot that know about Him, but they don't know Him personally. How personal, you ask? He says, verse 1, I know your name. Being a Christian isn't about a prescribed set of religious activities. It's not. It's not about loving mom, apple pie, and America. That's not being a Christian. That's being a good American. They're not synonymous. It's about a real intimate relationship with the God of the universe. You say, Pastor, what's that like? You know, last night we celebrated Nicole's 15th birthday. But I can remember when she was like that. And, and, the, and the best thing in my life and that she loved to do was run and jump up in my lap and turn around and call me Daddy. That's personal. That's intimate. If you don't know the God of the universe like that, you only know about Him. About Him. Knowing about Him, knowing Him, they're not the same. They're not. Secondly, our security comes from God. 
Some think when we talk about salvation that there's only going to be blue skies after salvation. Do you remember those words that I had you to underline? Notice in verse 2, it does not say if, but rather it says when. Notice what it says in verse 2. When you pass through the rivers, when you walk through fire, it doesn't say if, it says when. You know, I've noticed that success is a strong human motivator. Also notice fear is equally a strong human motivator. Here's God's purpose, or His promise rather. God's promise is, if we follow His purpose, we will know success. This is important. He, he also, He says we'll know trials. But it's important to know that we will know success. Well, let me explain it to you. Isaiah that wrote this, do you know what happened to Isaiah? He was sown in two by an evil king of Israel right in the temple. Sown in two. What about Noah? Noah preached 70 some years and he had a handful of converts that got on the ark with him. I have known friends that minister in Arab countries that have ministered for 20 years and they only have, if any, a small handful of converts. In America, we call them failures. Because all we care about is packing the seats and getting the checks written in American Christianity. But God has a different success plan. Can we call, can I just be honest with you for a second? Look up here. I'm telling you the truth because I love you. If our children only know about God, if our grandchildren only know about God, they may even be reverential in their knowledge about Him and their actions around rituals and religious institutions. But if they only know about Him, can we be a success? That's what's wrong with America. We, the church, are not asking those hard questions. We're not asking those questions. The reality is, there are going to be dangerous rivers. There's going to be dangerous fires. But in verse 2, listen what he, look what he promises. See, the question is not, do we measure up by the world standards? Or, or does our life measure up by the American dream? That's not the reality. We are achieving God's purpose for our lives. That's all that matters. Is are we achieving God's purpose? Here's the point. If we're going to follow God's purpose, then you and I need to understand that He's going to do a new thing. Verse 18 and 19. You might want to Highlight those verses, 18 and 19. God's going to do a new thing. Church, can you say new thing? You do when you say new thing. Everybody's like, oh, la, 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 and run outside. Right? God's going to do a new thing. Professionals love to recall the past. Many get paid for it. God does not. Listen closely as Paul writes in Philippians 3, 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those which are ahead. Holy moly. What could be for God? What could be for God? if churches would adopt that philosophy? What could be for your family if you would adopt that philosophy? You see, we're creatures of comfort. And we love comfort more than we love anything else. And comfort allows us to sit and look backward. But Paul, Paul, whether it was his successes or his failures. 
Paul says, listen, I've not arrived yet, but one thing I do know is for, I've got to forget what was success or failure in the past. God's going to do a new thing. Well, what is verse 18? It's a warning to stop living while looking in the rearview mirror. You know, I'd like to see God do a new thing right here in this church. I'd like to see God do a new thing in this, this community. And I'd like to see Him do a new thing in our country. That means crossing some rivers, though. That means enduring some fires. You know why God doesn't do much in most churches in America? Because we are based not upon pleasing God or finding the plan that God has for us. We're based on entertainment and entertaining you. But God wants to do a new thing. And that's going to require us crossing together some rivers and enduring some fires. I'd like to go forward. See, our tendency is to remember the good old days. Uh, what exactly is the good old days? Since I entered ministry 20 years ago, all I ever heard about was the good old days in the 1950s. Do y'all even read history? Y'all even know what went on in the 1950s for real? Let's go back further. What about the 30s and the Great Depression? Well, as you come up through and you look at the 50s, well, that World War II, or what about the Korean War? You know, what's interesting is I heard a man interviewed the other night about the pandemic and all that was going on and all that was in our world, even the riots. And he said, you know what, I grew up in World War II. And this isn't even close. I remember my grandfather talking about the sacrifice of World War II. Everybody was affected by it. That was the good old days. I remember my father talking about the Vietnam era. Y'all remember that? I don't, because I, I wasn't here then, but I, some of you were. But I remember them talking about it. About watching the boys you went to high school with being brought back in boxes. You see, it's human nature that where we are, where, wherever that is, and whatever day and age and era, is if you're in a place of comfort, you always remember the past is better than it really was. And God's telling us that that is a, a place of vulnerability, comfort. That He wants to do a new thing. But it's going to require crossing some rivers, enduring some fires. But the, the reality is, we tend to idolize and memorize the past as more than it was. It's a major problem. It prevents us from going forward. To what would God, what is it that he wants to do? We'll never know unless, unless we let go of the past. See, we tend to be trapped in the past. That's the death blow of God's purpose and plan in your life. Your life. He's holding on to the past unwilling to move forward. He says he wants to make a way forward. <laughs> it's an illustration here that God, just like he brought them out of Israel, he wants to bring us forward. But he allows some storms. Do you know why he allows storms in our life? People often ask, why does God allow storms? You know, it's interesting. I've been praying on this passage all week long. People don't understand the Bible. When you look at the Old Testament, it, it, it is writers historically copying what was, what happened. Their failure is to go back and investigate and understand the meaning of what was written for us to, to understand it. When you look at the Bible, it tells us that, that God put Israel into captivity. Can I tell you what that really means? God didn't say, that's it. 
I am mad at y'all. I'm fed up. You're going into captivity. That's what most people think. What it means is they continue to turn their back on God and they, they live by their own plan and they live by their own plan and they live by their own plan. And before you know it, a neighboring nation came in and conquered them. And God allowed it. When the Bible says he put them into captivity, it simply means if he didn't allow it, it wouldn't happen because he's God. It doesn't mean that he said, uh, Egyptians, I need you to come up and I need you to take them out. That's not what happened. They strayed and strayed and strayed outside the protection and the promises of God. They ended up in captivity. And he let, you see, he's going to take, he, he wants to take us forward. And so whether we choose to leave our comfort or we choose to leave his promises, he's going to get our attention one way or the other. And so people often ask, why does God, why do bad things happen? It's because we, when we are comfortable, I've seen it in a lot of your lives. When we get comfortable, we forget Him. We forget Him. When everything's going right, we forget Him. When our children are acting like, you know, they got some sense, we forget Him. When the job's going well, the economy's going well, we forget Him. And so He allows storms so that we know our limit. And we know that he's limitless. Second Corinthians twelve ten. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, this is Paul, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, he says, then I am strong. He wrote in Philippians four thirteen, I can do th all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you have shared in my distress. See, it doesn't matter how deep that we go or find ourselves in the middle of the river. He says he's enough. No matter how hot the fire is, he says I'll always be enough. The key is to keep going forward and trusting him. Pastor, what about so-and-so? Well, what about them? They, went, they just walked right away. They totally wiped out. Where was God when, when they needed him the most? Some of you miss the whole point sometimes of Peter's excursion on the sea in the storm with Jesus. If somebody wipes out, it's never God's fault. It's because we've taken our eyes off of him. God has never failed anyone. We regularly choose, though, not to trust him, not to follow his purpose and his plan, and then to blame him for our half-hearted efforts, our partial obedience. But listen to me. God has never taken his eyes off of us. Never. Look what it says in verse 3 and 4. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. And I will bring your offspring from the east. He's never taken his eyes off of us. Pastor, I've never had that kind of experience. See, this kind of experience for us, it means salvation. See, there should be and have been such a radical change on the inside of your life because that's the thing. If you've truly been saved, there has to be a radical change in you on the inside. At least, that's the thing the book points out. Because there is no good in us apart from Christ. I hear people all the time and they say, well, Preacher, I didn't have no radical change like, like you talk about. It distresses me. No, the outside of your life might not have looked as wicked as mine, 
But the inside of yours was just as wicked as the outside of mine looked. If you don't understand that, you probably never have met him. It's one thing the book, re it, it stresses. Look up here. Not me, not you. Nobody you know was prayed or was saved by praying some prayer. Nobody. Salvation only comes when you re realize and recognize just how wicked on the inside you are and you repent, you surrender to him. That's where salvation comes. See, we all have an Egypt story. That's what he's talking about in verses 3 and 4. He says, I, I gave you, I take, took you out of that place and put you in another place. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Man, that's incredible. In verse 4, he says, we're precious, precious in his sight. means he loved us. He loved us so much that he sacrificed his son for us. That's where our value, true value, that's where it comes from. Here's a humbling thing for you. There's absolutely nothing valuable in you. Nothing. That's the point of salvation. It's God's love toward us that makes us valuable. Isn't that incredible? You see, if God loves us, and because God loves us, that makes us valuable. He didn't love us because we are valuable, but He makes us valuable. When we fell, when we fail to understand that, it's not like stock market and stocks, when they fail, they lose value. We're valuable because He loves us. Not because of who we are, what we've done, or what we have all because of God that's the only reason we're valuable it's interesting I read an article in 1996 Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis her estate was auctioned off what I found interesting was some of the items in it and what they went for there was a worn footstool worn out went for 33 now this is in 96 of course, we're in the middle of whatever this is, so maybe it's more valuable than it is now. But in 96, a worn footstool went for $33,350. A silver tape measure, like all of us men probably has got three in our truck, went for $48,875. A walnut tobacco humidifier, a nasty old cigar box, went for $574,500. Why? Because it belonged to the late President Kennedy. That's what made it valuable. If you belong to Jesus, you're, you're infinitely valuable. Do you know him personally? The God of the Bible. Not because mama always went to church and I, you know, I, not, I, I'm, a, I'm an American or I'm a conservative or I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or, or I believe in the Constitution. None of those things make you valuable. I'm sorry to tell you. Not because you believe there is a God. Not because you know about Him. Not because you went through Sunday school or sermon after sermon after sermon. Do you know Him personally? As personally and as intimately as when my little girl, who's not little anymore, would crawl up into my lap. Do you know Him that person? That's how personal and intimate it's meant to be. 
You need to know not about Him. You need to know Him. That's where the meaning of life comes. That's where value in life comes. Would you bow your heads this morning? Not religious activities. Not a certain denomination. None of those things are, are of top importance in life. The only thing that really matters in life is discovering God's plan for you and fulfilling it. And the first thing in that plan is knowing Him personally. Do you know Him personally? Has there ever been a time, yes, I, I lead people through prayers at the end, but I'm giving you an example of a real life conversation. As much as if you would talk to me after the service, you need to have this conversation with the God of the universe. You can't, you can't get to know him personally like I talked about, intimately like I talked about, if you can't have this first conversation with him. The first thing you need to do is acknowledge to, what, to him that, that you are. You're wicked on the inside. I don't care if you've been the most moral, upstanding person in our community for years. On the inside, you can never be saved until you realize that we're all wicked on the inside. And then tell him that you surrendered to his life, your life to him, and you're going to turn from that life. And that all that you have is his. And ask him to come into your heart and wash you with the blood of his son. That's what you need her to do right now. Father, into your hand I commit this time, these decisions. And Father, I praise you that I am valuable special in your sight. Lord, I love you because you first loved me. I glorify you because you and you alone are worthy. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The altar is open this morning. Be surrounded by the 
Let it be, Jesus. Let it be, let it be, Jesus. Let it be, let it be for me to live this Christ. For me to live this Christ. God, I breathe. Let it be, Jesus. Amen. And if you're wondering, yeah, I felt the same way about my kid, my boys when they're small, but they don't like it when I say that in public. You know? <laughs> God bless you and have a great week as we serve the Lord. Listen, in all this chaos, there's no greater time than right now Amen. to share the gospel. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Graduated. Yeah. Good job.